Anyway, what, what I'm going to tell you about today is how we've been using um, advanced techniques, including the, uh, uh, the uh, ECHO 550, to um, improve shotgun metagenomic protocols so we can uh, reveal the impact of the gut microbiome. So uh, when, we, uh, when, when we think about the human body, um, it's, truly, uh, it's truly a remarkable uh, machine in many ways, and we're still just starting to scratch the surface of what it does. And a really important part of that was the Human Genome Project, uh, which was an expensive uh, government-funded effort to really uh, uncover the blueprints for ourselves as human beings. And, um, and uh, so the estimated cost of the Human Genome Project was about $3.8 billion. Although already in 2013, uh, when President Obama unveiled the Brain Initiative, at that point, the return on investment had already been estimated at 140 to 1. So for every dollar spent sequencing, uh, learning how to sequence a human genome, $140 had already been returned to the economy at that point. Um, but uh, but uh, we're still finding out a lot about the human genome and the human body. And uh, it's fascinating to think about, uh, the, about what might be in there. So, um, so, so suppose your gut came with, for example, uh, a data logger. You definitely want to know what it was recording, what it might be able to read out about you today, what it might be able to predict about the future. Suppose your gut contained a drug factory. Suppose uh, there was a complex chemical, uh, uh, chemical factory in there producing all kinds of things like antibiotics and other antimicrobial compounds, uh, antidepressants, all kinds of other chemicals. You'd really want to know what it was doing and how it worked, right? And uh, perhaps more soberingly, uh, what if your gut contained a time bomb? In that case, you'd really want to understand what made it tick and perhaps how to diffuse it. So uh, I'd argue that all of these things are literally true in terms of uh, not, your gut, uh, not your human genome, but in terms of your gut microbiome. And uh, microbiome science is really revolutionizing how we see ourselves as human beings. And uh, I just want you to take a moment to think about what you saw uh, when you looked in the mirror this morning. So, um, so I saw an organism that's just 43% human, and not just because it was early and I hadn't had my damn coffee yet. But uh, when we think about what makes us up as, uh, as human beings, each of us has, according to the latest estimates, uh, about 30 trillion human cells, uh, but about 39 trillion microbial cells. And so that's where that 43% human number comes from. You might, <coughs> um, you, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, uh, we should really be thinking about this at the DNA level, not at the level of cell counts. So let's think about that for a moment. Uh, so each of us has about 20,000 human genes, depending on, again, what exactly you want to count as a gene in terms of non-coding RNAs and so forth. But the size of our microbial gene catalog is unambiguously much larger, uh, ranging from 2 to 20 million microbial genes. And so by that measure, we're at best 1% human. And uh, this, this is particularly interesting given all the excitement at the moment about systems biology, systems medicine, and so on, because it's pretty hard to do systems anything when we're neglecting 99% of that system, which is what we're doing when we neglect all of the biochemical functions included in those microbial genes. And another very important point to make is uh, outside of Star Trek, we don't change our, our human genomes very often, right? Whereas in contrast, uh, our microbiomes, we change every day of our lives. Um, and especially the period from birth through the first three years of life, uh, we undergo particularly profound changes in the microbiome and in that repertoire of microbial genes. And this is really a big data problem. So uh, it turns out that each teaspoon of your stool contains about the same amount of data encoded in the DNA of the bacteria that are in there as a ton of DVDs. So uh, being able to access and being able to read all of that data and ultimately being able to write yourself a new microbiome that provides an improved state is very much the goal of what we're trying to uh, engage in at the moment. So the backdrop to a lot of this work uh, is the Human Microbiome Project, um, which I was uh, involved in in a number of capacities. Uh, and uh, again, this was a large-scale uh, NIH project based at uncovering basic biology, not on quite the same scale as the Human Genome Project, but still fairly large. So the total cost of the project was about $173 million. Uh, one of the largest components was the baseline cohort study, looking at uh, 250 people, more or less, who were rigorously screened as being healthy at every one of 18 sites on the body that we were examining the microbiome in. And as you can imagine, that's a lot of different places to stick a Q-tip. 
so anyway, these people were, um, were sampled at up to three time points, and we collected four and a half trillion bases of DNA using two technologies. Uh, one is 16S ribosomal RNA uh, amplicon profiling, which gives, you, it gives us a readout of which uh, kinds of microbes are in each, uh, in, in each location. Then the second was shotgun metagenomic sequencing, where you just take all the DNA, break it up into little fragments, um, and then try to reconstruct the puzzle from all those pieces of DNA. <coughs> so so one, one thing that was remarkable about the Human Microbiome Project was how rapidly the results escaped from the pages of uh, scientific journals like Science and, Yet, uh, and Nature, so that just a few weeks later, uh, it was on the cover of Scientific American, and just a couple of weeks after that, on the cover of The Economist. And there are, uh, there are companies with billion dollar valuations today that didn't exist when we were completing the Human Genome Project uh, based around the microbiome. So, um, so the great thing about this project was that we had an unprecedented amount of DNA sequence data about the microbiome. But that, that was also the terrible thing about the project. So to illustrate this, I'm just showing you the first file of data from the Human Microbiome Project. Uh, and it's pretty hard to tell who lives where in the environment from this, right? Despite the fact that what we're fundamentally doing is an ecology project where we care about who lives where in, uh, with, with which other organisms and at which relative abundance. And uh, you probably can't even tell that that's an oral sample, let alone the sequencing sig uh, signatures that we would use to make that determination. And uh, the worst part is that there's another 17,000 files just like this one, and I'm just showing you the first 0.1% of this file. So you can see how we really have our work cut out, uh, making any sense out of the data. And uh, this is really a problem for clinicians, right? Because you know, what, what, is, your, uh, what, what, uh, what, what is your doctor going to do if uh, you, you come to them and you say, uh, you know, I did a citizen science project like American Gut, which I'll tell you about later, or I went to some company that sequenced my microbiome, and uh, I have some great news for you, doc, because now I have a thousand species that were in my gut that they found. Or even better yet, I have this list of a million genes that were in my gut, uh, and surely with all this data and the 15 minutes that we have together, you're going to be able to tell me what's wrong with me, right? And, and what's your physician going to do? Like maybe they can refer you to their colleagues in psychiatry for being crazy enough to think that uh, they're going to do something with that profile. Uh, and so, so the challenge facing us is to make it not crazy anymore, but to figure out how we can use this data, especially with the increasing ra uh, increasing re uh, rapid ability to generate the data, uh, how can we integrate that one profile with yourself over time or with other people in different states of health and disease and interpret what it actually means in a user-understandable and ultimately uh, patient-understandable way. So, uh, so, so to do this, uh, we, we developed this processing pipeline, um, initially based around amplicon sequencing, but now the same software tools work for shotgun metagenomics, work for metabolomics, work for a wide range of other high throughput assays. And, um, and uh, a lot of this was developed by uh, Micah Hamady uh, and Kathy Lazapone, two of my first graduate students uh, back at Boulder. Um, so the idea for the, on the sequencing side is that when we, uh, when we build libraries from each sample, initially by PCR, uh, but um, more recently with shotgun metagenomics, we can add a tag onto each of those libraries uh, that uses error correcting code so that we can read out, um, so, so we can read out uh, that barcode uniquely when we later sequence the DNA. Then we mix the samples together. Uh, initially, we sequenced them on 454, but more recently, we've moved to Illumina, which has much better error character characteristics and much better throughput. Um, and then, as soon as the data comes off the instrument, uh, we use this pipeline called CHIME, which stands for Quantitative Insights into Microbial Ecology, uh, developed by Greg Capareso, Jess Stumbauer, Justin Kaczynski, and uh, many others in my lab. Uh, Greg's now a faculty member at NAU. And uh, basically, um, basically, exactly the same software runs everywhere from your laptop to the Amazon EC2 cloud to the $24 million Comet supercomputer over in SDSC. And um, what Chime does is it takes the data off the instrument, uh, uses those barcodes to assign each sequence uh, to the sample it came from. Um, then uh, we can do multiple sequence alignments, group the related sequences into what are called operational taxonomic units. Uh, build phylogenetic trees, and then use the locations on the phylogenetic tree to relate the communities to one another uh, at the whole community level by the evolution of the organisms in them using an algorithm that Kathy developed called Unifrag uh, for the unique fraction metric. And that gives us these maps showing the layout of where all of the different, uh, where all of the different microbial communities are with respect to one another. So applying this pipeline to the Human Microbiome Project data, 
we turn all of those uninterpretable sequences into this much more interpretable map. And so what's going on here is that each point on this map represents all of the complexity of a microbial community, uh, like all the complexity of this oral biofilm, distilled just down onto one point on this map. And so what we're doing is we're doing a principal coordinates anal uh, analysis reduction of unifract distances. So two points are close together on the map if they have more similar microbiomes. They're further apart on the map if they have more dissimilar microbiomes. And I'm showing you this uh, based, on, uh, based on data from 16S, but we can do exactly the same thing from shotgun metagenomic data and from anything else that uh, allows you to build up a taxonomic profile. So, uh, so when you think about all of the things that might affect a microbiome, you can imagine all kinds of stuff that might be important, like the age of the subject, uh, whether they're male or female. Remember that this is a healthy cohort, so there are no disease associations, but there's a lot of other stuff that might affect uh, where a particular microbiome is placed on that map. And uh, it turns out that the most important feature is something that's fairly obvious in retrospect, although uh, there was still controversy about it at the time we were doing the HMP. So the most important feature is body side. We're almost like different continents on this map. Uh, the mouth and the skin and the vaginal and the fecal communities are very different from one another. And the reason why this was still uh, uncertain at the time the HMP was done is that typically different investigators had used different methods to study different populations if they were interested in different parts of the body. And so as a result, it was impossible to tell which of the differences in those individual data sets in the literature were due to things like the choice of DNA extraction or the choice of PCR primers or other things that we know can affect the result massively. And so the Human Microbiome Project for the first time provided a consistent method across a large number of sites on the body and a large number of subjects to produce an over, uh, overall view of what mattered the most in the human microbiome, at least among healthy subjects. And so to illustrate this, if I show you the, uh, show you the mouth and the gut of the first person in the HMP, you can see that they're in totally different regions on that plot. And it wasn't until we did the Earth Microbiome Project looking at different physical habitats around the planet that we truly understood how profoundly different these communities were. Because if you think of your mouth as being kind of like a coral reef with complex mineralized structures covered with biofilms that perhaps your dentist pesters you about from time to time, the amazing fact is that the mouth of this person is as far away from their gut in terms of the microbial ecology as the microbes in the water in this reef are from the microbes in the dirt in this prairie. And that's amazing, right? Because what it means is that a few feet along the length of your body makes as much of a difference to your microbial communities as thousands of miles across the Earth's surface. <clears throat> Um, so, so this sort of thing has led a lot of people to wonder uh, how can they claim a place for themselves on this kind of microbial map. And so uh, the American Gut Project, which we launched over Thanksgiving of 2012, uh, provides, a, uh, provides a, a possibility for anyone to claim a pin for themselves on this map. And uh, what we're doing is we're making the project indefinitely scalable by using a combination of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing um, to reach out to ordinary members of the public who are interested in their microbiomes, who essentially support the cost of adding themselves to the project, kind of like National Geographic's Genographic Project and other citizen science projects like that. Um, and so we launched this over Thanksgiving of, 20, uh, of 2012, uh, Thanksgiving being a time when a lot of Americans are thinking about their gut for reasons I can't possibly imagine. Um, anyway, it turns out that not everyone wants to know what's in there. So these middle schoolers touring our lab and uh, learning that what we're going to do is use, la uh, use lasers and robots to look at the bacteria in their poop. And you can, see, you can certainly see a degree of response heterogeneity there. Uh, we don't yet know whether that's linked to the microbiome, although sooner or later we'll have the sample size to find out. But uh, in all seriousness, it's been remarkably successful for a citizen science project because most of these projects are on the scale of a few thousand dollars. But uh, in American Gut, we've already raised over two million, um, essentially all the $99 increments from members of the general population. Uh, although now that we have 501c3 status to UCSD, uh, we're able to accept donations to target particular disease populations or uh, to run trials of uh, the effects of using a particular product uh, or that kind of thing. So the, um, so, so the potential uh, to find out a lot more is definitely there. And uh, we've, we've had over 10,000 people sign up. Uh, over 8,000 samples have been publicly released. And essentially, we just release all the data from this project as soon as it comes off the sequencer. And the intention here is for any student, for any researcher, uh, whether they're at the, a university or at a government lab or at a company, um, any, uh, any interested patient or physician should just be able to go to this large resource and see what a large number of microbiomes look like in association with any uh, other information that we have from the questionnaires and other things about each subject.
And as I said, this has been very popular. So this is Embry et Hyde, who's the uh, program manager for the project in my lab, uh, accepting the People's Choice Award for the project at the um, uh, Personal Genome Project meeting, uh, the GET meeting that George Church organizes every year at Harvard Medical School. And, um, uh, uh, and, and so uh, what this award is, was basically the, uh, the, the audience voting on which of the various phenotyping projects they thought were, uh, what was the most exciting. And this was up against whole body MRI scans and uh, regrowing tissue issues from, uh, from stem cells re-derived re from the patient's skin and that kind of thing. So, uh, so we're up against some pretty stiff competition. Anyway, uh, what's cool about the American Gut Project is that we're doing it on a scale of thousands of people. And, um, and so, uh, and, and so uh, what's really exciting about this is that we can see a lot more subtle effects than you can see if you're only looking at a few hundred, uh, like for example, the Human Microbiome Project. So uh, for example, you might have expected that the microbiome in your gut changes as you age, uh, which it certainly does, um, and, and that's highly statistically significant. Uh, but another thing that's just as statistically significant is how many hours of sleep you get at night, uh, which also has a substantial impact on your gut microbiome. And uh, getting less sleep at night is correlated with a relatively, no, uh, relatively low microbiome diversity, um, which is uh, similar to some of the changes that have been seen uh, leading to insulin resistance, leading to obesity, uh, and, uh, and, and even leading to depression, all of which, uh, all, all of which are involved with sleep issues. And uh, the really great thing about having this large population with many, many different, um, uh, many, many different characterizations of their phenotype is that we can finally start to build an effect size of what has a large effect versus what has a small effect on the microbiome. And so uh, these power, power calculations were put together by Justine Debelius in my lab where on the x-axis what we're looking at is uh, the, number, um, the number of people uh, per group. And then on the y-axis we're looking at the statistical power of the test. So 0.8 means you have an 80% chance of uh, telling the difference between two categories. Uh, one means you have a 100% chance. And uh, essentially the steeper the curve, the larger the effect of a particular phenomenon on the gut microbiome. And so uh, what's, what's interesting about this is that we can see a lot of things with relatively large effect like age, uh, like whether, you, whether or not you have IBD, uh, like whether or not you took antibiotics recently. But interestingly, what time of year you collected the sample has a relatively large impact. And that seasonality is something that we're exploring in a number of populations now, ranging from Western populations uh, to the Hadza hunter-gatherers in Tanzania. Um, but you can also see a lot of other things that we can pick up, like whether you're male or female, uh, how much you sleep, uh, how much you weigh, uh, how much you drink, uh, even if you have very large populations, how much you exercise, or I should say how much you say you exercise, because all of this is self-reported data. So either we pick up an effect of exercise or we pick up an effect of lying about it. And uh, we're, we're, doing, we're doing some work with the UCSD student athlete population at the moment, uh, whose, whose coaches are pretty good at like keeping them on task and making sure they're actually doing the physical activity and, and not lying to us about it on the questionnaire. Uh, but one thing that's amazing is that the steepest curve here is the number of different kinds of plants that people eat. And uh, that has a larger effect than even things like, um, e even things like disease or things like treatment of disease. Uh, so what, what's amazing about this is that lifestyle factors that you have control over can have a tremendous impact on your microbiome. And what we're trying to find out at the moment is uh, how to harness that impact in directions that are good rather than bad. Um, but we've been expanding the uh, American Gut project in a lot of different ways. Uh, so first we started with international expansion into British gut and into Australian gut, mainly because it was really easy to translate all the materials from English into English. But, um, <laughs> but we're moving into uh, additional populations like Singapore, uh, Norway and others um, this, uh, th th this year. And, uh, and um, uh, let's see, I think China as well. And then, we've, as, as I mentioned, we've, we've also been reaching out to particular targeted populations, so uh, those with auto, uh, autism spectrum disorders, uh, those in the ICU, so you can see that the microbiome of people in the ICU in blue is totally different from the microbiomes of people in the American gut population as a whole. Um, and then various outreach projects with, uh, with, with students, with uh, various, uh, various museums, um, including now the Fleet Science Center here. 
and various other populations, um, including some of the healthiest and sickest populations at UCSD, ranging from things like uh, the, the student athletes and uh, the, the Stein Institute of uh, Research and Aging's um, healthy aging cohorts, uh, all the way to uh, patients in the cardiac wards and the oncology wards and uh, 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 Bill Sanborn's IBD practice and so forth, uh, being able to, being able to uh, really create a map of where different microbiome states place you on the map. And so the best example we have of this uh, comes, from works, uh, comes from some work we did with Alex Kurutz and Mike Sadowski uh, at the University of Minnesota. And this is just to reorient you on the Human Microbiome Project data set. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you the uh, gut microbiomes of some people with Clostridium difficile uh, associated disease. So C. diff is one of the, um, uh, one, one of the uh, most severe hospital acquired infections um, in, uh, and one of the major health problems uh, in hospitals in the United States at the moment. Uh, it kills about 14,000 people a year, and it's a particularly nasty form of diarrhea. When I show you fecal samples from people with C. diff, uh, what you can see is that they have these totally different microbiomes. So that's these, um, that's these orange stars, and you can see that they're totally different from, the, uh, from a normal, healthy uh, fecal microbiome. Uh, okay, so what's going to happen is four of these patients are going to get a fecal transplant from one donor. And as you can see, that one donor is uh, squarely in the healthy state uh, as defined by the Human Microbiome Project. And um, if, you're wondering what a, um, if, if you're wondering what a fecal transplant actually is, uh, this is Bill Sanborn, who's our uh, chair of gastroenterology. Uh, he's about to administer one uh, using hospital-grade stool from a nonprofit called Open Biome. Uh, so one thing you need to remember is that in the United States, uh, feces is regulated by the FDA as a drug, and uh, you're not allowed to just use any crap you happen to uh, have available. Um, you, you, have to do a, uh, you have to do some rigorous screening procedures on it. And so uh, Bill gets his from, uh, for, from uh, Open Biome, which is a nonprofit in Boston. Uh, that, that originated from Eric Arm's lab. So anyway, what's going to happen is that four of these patients are going to get a fecal transplant from that one donor who's down in the healthy region. <coughs> and so the question is, uh, are you going to see any change in their symptoms, and how long is it going to take? And so these, these plots were put together by Antonio and Yoshiki, uh, two very talented computer scientists in my lab, and each frame in this is going to be one day in the life of the microbiomes of these patients. And what you can see is essentially immediately their entire microbiomes transform until they're all in the healthy state down at the bottom. And that just took a couple of frames. So within a couple of days, all of their microbiomes are in the healthy state. And this is coupled to uh, a remission of all of, their, uh, all, of their, uh, all of their diarrheal symptoms. And so you have people who have been bedridden for months uh, getting up and uh, walking around again and producing firm stool in some cases for the first time in years. And uh, this fecal microbiota transplant uh, procedure has been remarkably effective for recurrent C. diff. Um, so the last large-scale trial that I know of that directly compared uh, fecal transplant to antibiotics for recurrent C. diff had to be stopped early because the fecal transplant was over 90% effective, which is typical for recurrent C. diff. Uh, the antibiotics were, were only about 30% effective, which is also typical for recurrent C. diff. And it was considered unethical to continue withholding the fecal transplant from the patients in the antibiotic arm of the trial. So they all got the fecal transplant, and most of them recovered. And so the question that's facing us now is for what other diseases can we identify this kind of problem with the microbiome and then reshape it so that it comes back into health, uh, whether we're talking about something that seems as extreme as, uh, uh, whether, whether we're talking about something that seems as extreme as fecal transplant or something that seems as benign as changing your diet and reshaping your microbiome that way, uh, or something in between like better antibiotics, uh, like other therapies that modify the microbiome, like metformin, PPIs, and so forth. Um, like, uh, uh, um, uh, like probiotics, like prebiotics, maybe even phage therapy, and all of the other things that we're seeing is reshaping the microbiome. And so we need to do it for the whole range of different diseases uh, that we and other labs have linked over the last decade to the microbiome, ranging from the expected like inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome, which you might have expected, well, obviously the gut microbiome's involved in those, uh, to things that are more surprising like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, colon cancer, and liver cancer, um, and then to the really surprising like autism, uh, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, all of which have recently been linked to the microbiome, both in humans and in animal models.
And so to do this, what we have to do is we really have to find the good places and the bad places on this map. But really we need to go beyond making a map and building more of a microbial GPS that tells you not just where am I right now, uh, but where do I want to go in terms of this microbiome configuration space and what do I need to do step by step in order to get there. And uh, because I'm in the Department of Pediatrics, ideally we'll, we want to develop this thing and make it so easy to use that even small children can use it. So you can imagine a kind of smart toilet where as soon as you flush, it's going to do some instant analysis of your microbiome or perhaps your metabolome and predict the microbiome from that and then deliver it to your smartphone, which let's face it, I bet you're using in there anyway. Um, and uh, and shows you, uh, you know, uh, did you get, uh, with your latest data dump, is that taking you in a good direction or is it taking you in a bad direction? Um, and are there any things that you should be doing in particular to modify your behavior uh, for lifelong health? And so you might be wondering, uh, can I actually predict my health from my microbiome rather than, rather than just reading out current state? And, um, and so shortly after I got to UCSD a little over two years ago, uh, I met with Larry Smarr, who's our director of CalIT2, and uh, he invited me over to his 64 million pixel display wall, which is what we're standing in front of. So it's a wall that's quite a lot bigger than this wall here uh, with high-res display screens, so we can really do uh, a serious data visualization. And you probably recognize that plot that I'm showing him, which is the Human Microbiome Project uh, data set. And, and he said, well, well, you know, Rob, I have a very interesting microbiome myself because I'm an, uh, I'm an IBD patient. And what do I need to do to get myself onto that kind of map? So uh, anyway, as any of you who have uh, moved from one institution to another or one company to another uh, likely know, uh, when you move, you expect a certain amount of crap from your colleagues. And in my case, it's literally been true. So this box of Larry's stool showed up in my, in my lab on dry ice. And uh, Larry's a very interesting guy because he's been measuring properties of his own body uh, for the last 17 years, starting with one dimension, which is his weight, and then adding a few dozen dimensions with different stool tests, a few hundred dimensions with, um, with, with additional blood tests, thousands of dimensions with SNP profiling, uh, and now millions of dimensions with microbiome sequencing. And so uh, he'd been generating uh, microbiome data uh, using taxonomic profiling with 16S ribosomal RNA uh, on himself for a while. And uh, the drawback to this kind of data, which many of you have probably seen already, is that you get a report that looks like this, where you have uh, a whole bunch of different kinds of microbes. Uh, I'm not going to read out all those names, but basically the different colors correspond to different kinds of microbes, and they go up and they go down, but you can't really uh, get a lot out of that or interpret it. And don't worry if you don't get anything out of that, because neither did Larry, uh, despite spending a whole lot of computer time and a whole lot of personnel effort uh, trying to figure it out. Um, but when we replot it with the kinds of tools that I've been showing you, uh, what we get is a much more interpretable graph. And so this is just rotating the, the data around uh, to uh, show you what it looks like in 3D. And what's going to happen is we're going to animate it through time. So what you can see is he starts off in this corner of the graph, moves through this blue region, switches over into the red, and then bounces around at random in the red, as opposed to the directional travel through the blue region. Um, well, so that's nice. Uh, we, we, get, we get a much clearer a pattern, but what does it actually mean? Well, what we can do is we can link it up to all of Larry's uh, information about his own physiological state. And so what we can see is that this initial shift at the beginning of the time series is caused by antibiotics. And then, uh, during what Larry calls his blue region, where you have this decline in weight and you have this directional shift in the microbiome, things are going pretty badly with, uh, with frequent IBD symptoms and his life is pretty unpleasant. Uh, but then when he changes his medications, you see this very rapid switch from the blue into the red. And as soon as he's in the red zone, where he's bouncing around more or less at random, as soon as he enters that red zone, what you see is that his health goes back, uh, his weight goes back up to a healthy set point. Uh, most of his IBD symptoms are gone, and uh, he stays at that uh, healthy set point for at least months. And basically, he was fine for, uh, for, for a couple of years after that. And so what's amazing about that is had we known about Larry's individual microbiome configuration space, we would have been able to tell him that as soon as he got into that red region, he was going to be fine for a while. This is exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to do on a much larger scale uh, with a cohort of Bill Sanborn's patients, um, uh, uh, try, trying to figure out uh, how much can we predict about future response to medications and, um, and, uh, and uh, cycles of uh, flare and remission for IBD and ultimately for many other immune complicated diseases uh, where you have these very complex patterns uh, of, of disease time course where even uh, a little bit of ability to predict what's going to happen a few months down the track would be incredibly useful for guiding treatment as well as for stratifying patients for the right drug. 
So, uh, so there's been a lot of studies linking drugs to the microbiome. These really, um, they, these really motivate the move from, uh, from the kinds of uh, taxonomic profiling that I've been showing you towards going more to a, to, to a shotgun metagenomics approach because we need to know not just who's there, uh, like reading off their name tags, but we need to know what they're actually doing. And to do that, we need to uh, have a much better view of their function. So, the, so the, first, the first of these papers uh, came from Jeremy Nicholson's lab, showing that what microbes you have in the gut have a tremendous impact on your ability to uh, metabolize acetaminophen, um, one of the most common painkillers that's prescribed. But uh, then uh, shortly afterwards, Pete Tenbaugh's lab uh, did this very elegant paper in science, showing that Egatella lenta, uh, a, a kind of uh, gut bacterium that some people have and other people lack, uh, explains whether or not, uh, wh whether or not uh, the, the cardiac glycoside digoxin works for you. And basically there are some strains of agatella that have a plasmid that's able to degrade digoxin very efficiently. And if you have that particular plasmid and that particular strain, uh, what's going to happen is that, um, is, is that digoxin is going to be essentially ineffective, whereas uh, if you don't have that strain, then it works a lot better. And then the same sort of thing has been shown for a range of drugs, including anti-cancer agents like cyclophosphamide, um, and, then, uh, and, and then for, uh, for metformin, which is used for diabetes treatment and also used, um, and, and also used as a life extension agent um, uh, by, uh, at least that's been very successful in animal studies. Uh, the human data is not really uh, compelling yet, but quite a lot of people believe it enough to take it themselves. And one thing to watch out for with, uh, with, with a lot of these drug treatments is uh, as, well as, uh, as, as well as the drug treatment itself, depending on what microbes you have, the drug treatment itself can modify the microbiome. And so you may get a very different response to the same drug depending on the microbiome of the patient. And uh, building on what I was saying earlier, the idea that you could, t you could take someone and categorize them as a responder or a non-responder, or even more excitingly, identify them in the non-responder category and modify their microbiome to get them into the responder category is a very exciting emerging direction at the moment. So, um, so this is what really highlights the problems of 16S ribosomal RNA amplicon profiling though. Um, we, do, we don't really get to the species, so very typically we're getting uh, results at about the genus level. Um, and the process for picking OTUs or operational taxonomic units is, rel uh, is relatively complex. Um, so so just, just to get a quick sense of the audience, uh, could I see a show of, uh, show of hands? How many of you know what an OTU is? Um, not very many of you. And how, how, how many of you have actually run an OTU picking algorithm yourself? One, yeah, okay. So, so basically what you have to do is you have to take all that sequence data and then build it into clusters where you're saying that each of those clusters has about the same amount of diversity as a genus or a species or a family or whatever. And, um, and so uh, you have to explain a lot about how different parts of the molecule evolve at different rates and different species and that kind of thing. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then the physician you gave the data to uh, turns right around to the patient and says, so this is a readout of the species that are in your gut. And then you're like, well, no, that's not really true. Uh, let me explain these to use again, and you just have to keep on doing that over and over. Um, there's, there's bias in the PCR primers, uh, so uh, the primers that you use to amplify the particular region of the gene you're going to look at uh, don't work equally well for all sequences, so you have some bias there um, uh, so that the abundances can't re match reality. You'll see some companies that overtrain their, their procedure on just one standard, but then when you run it on any, other, uh, on any other sample of DNA where you know what the frequencies are, it doesn't work at all well. Uh, you can't see the viruses because they don't have the 16S gene. Uh, there's lots of bickering in the field about things like primer choices, OTU picking methods and so on uh, that probably you don't want to get into. Um, let's see, in principle, uh, longer reads uh, would be preferable to the short reads that we can easily get on the Illumina platform uh, that most people in the field have standardized on. Um, and then low complexity libraries like the Amplicon libraries are problematic on the pattern flow cells that are in the newer generations of the Illumina instruments. So you might be wondering, well, why not we just move to shotgun sequencing for everything? And the main issue is that it's expensive. Um, historically, it also needs way too much DNA. Uh, the computational methods are really hard, especially if you're doing assembly, so you're trying to piece together from all those little fragments uh, what does the puzzle look like that stitches it all together. Um, we can't handle samples that contain a lot of host DNA. So if you're dealing with stool, which is essentially all bacterial DNA, you're fine. But if you're dealing with something like a tumor biopsy, uh, then you're really in trouble because essentially what you're going to do is just resequence the human genome really expensively. Uh, but we can solve all of these problems with technology that exists now. 
So, um, so a lot of this is based on a pipeline that we're putting together that uh, combines the Echo 550 that we have uh, with, with other things like, uh, like, like the MySeq from Illumina that we're doing a lot of testing on before scaling up to things like the, uh, the HiSeq uh, and, and NovaSeq platforms. Uh, and then we also use the, uh, we also use the Mosquito uh, in some parts of this. And essentially, um, and, and essentially the advantage of the, uh, of the Echo is that it provides uh, a, variable, um, a variable volume going into each well. Uh, the advantage to the mosquito is that it can do bead cleanup steps, which are not feasible on the Echo platform. And given that, uh, given that uh, neither instrument is modifiable uh, to be able to provide the capabilities that the other one has, combining them into one pipeline lets us uh, dramatically increase, uh, increase throughput and decrease cost. And the reason why that's really important is, um, and these, these are some slides put together by my collaborator, Dan Knights, who had been doing a lot of the software development for this, uh, for, he was a former postdoc in my lab, but he's now at the University of Minnesota. Uh, essentially, the traditional picture has uh, been that it's relatively cheap, but less accurate to do 16S profiling, whereas whole genome shotgun has been an order of magnitude more expensive, uh, even though it can get you down to the strain level uh, resolution and allow you to see the genes and the viruses that you cannot see with 16S. And so our solution to this is uh, what we're calling shallow shotgun sequencing, where what we're doing is we're collecting about 500,000 sequences, which we can do at a cost of not much more than the 50 bucks or so that the, the fixed costs of Amplicon sequencing um, uh, lock, lock you into. And uh, the idea is instead of going extremely deep with shotgun metagenomics, uh, we can get a, rel a relatively shallow surface picture and then use some fancy uh, mathematical inference techniques to figure out from what we saw, what do the rest of the genomes look like. Um, so, uh, so, so, so the software from Dan's lab uh, that's doing this is called Shogun, and what it gets you is it gets you species profiles that are near the quality of what you get from whole genome shotgun. So if you're looking at the species profiles, um, this is on a log scale for sequencing depth. And so what you can see is that by the time you get to 10, uh, just 10,000 sequences per sample, uh, you've essentially got a species profile that's leveled out at what you would get if you collected 100 million sequences from each sample. And uh, we, we actually went way beyond this, so we did a full HiSeq 4000 run on each of two individual specimens and showed that even if you went out to a billion sequences per sample, uh, this curve still wouldn't saturate. Um, and then similarly, uh, when you look at the depth of sequencing versus your ability to pick up, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so, so, so one of the huge advantage of this using the Shogun pipeline versus relying on marker genes, like for example, uh, Metaflan does, is that most of the genes in the genome are not marker genes, and so you're throwing away most of the data. And so, uh, even, um, and, and so even, uh, even when you get to 100 billion sequences, uh, you don't get anywhere close to the uh, match to the ground truth that you, uh, that you get with, uh, with a statistically corrected pipeline. And uh, when you look at the gene level, um, uh, uh, again, if you look at Shogun, um, you're, getting, uh, you're getting pretty good gene level predictions around the uh, 100,000 to 1 million sequence, uh, sequences range. Uh, if you use PyCrust, which is our tool for uh, estimating what the gene frequencies look like from 16S data alone, um, what you get is you get, um, you, you get saturation at a much lower level, uh, and, and so it's a lot more consistent, but you don't get nearly as uh, good a match to the ground truth that you get from the shotgun metagenomics. And uh, as I mentioned, um, one thing that's really cool about it uh, is that Shogun's able to predict genes that you don't observe even when you do the deep, uh, the deep shotgun metagenomics directly. And this is due to a whole lot of biases in, in library construction, uh, a whole lot of biases, um, uh, a whole lot of biases in uh, actually uh, sequencing. So, uh, for example, the uh, GC-rich regions don't always hybridize as well on the flow cell and so forth. Uh, but what, what you can see is that when you sequence to 30 million sam uh, sequences per sample and observe that directly, uh, you only pick up about half of the genes that we know for sure are present in the metagenomes uh, based, on, uh, ba based, based on mock community sequencing. And so uh, what's amazing about this is that even if you had really, really deep shotgun coverage data, you'd get a worse result rather than a better result from what you can do with shallow coverage and an improved model for statistical correction. Um, so, uh, so, the key, um, so the key to Shogun is that we have to have good reference libraries and we have to make it cheap. And uh, so there's two, ways, the, there's two ways that we're doing that. So one is by miniaturizing uh, the workflow uh, by a factor of 10 using the Echo. So essentially what we do is we extract the DNA on the uh, EP Motion liquid handling uh, platform, purify it with the Kingfisher, 
uh, normalize it with the echo, uh, do the shotgun library prep with the mosquito, um, so that's the bead cleanup step. Uh, then we evaluate the libraries by qPCR, renormalize on the echo in sequence. And believe it or not, because this looks like a lot of processing steps, uh, but this whole procedure can be done in about two hours for the Nextera uh, XT kits and about, six, uh, and about six hours for the Kappa Hyper Plus kits uh, that give you much better assembly. And uh, we've been looking at um, we've been looking at analysis of uh, control uh, of, of DNA controls. And what's amazing about this is that with just 5,000 cells, we, we routinely recover 98% of the genome, except for some of those uh, high GC regions that are missed. But, uh, and this, this is work that Jake, uh, Jake Minnick, who's uh, here in the audience today, has been doing in collaboration with NASA at GPL. Uh, what's amazing is that with just 50 cells, we can still retrieve 30% of the genome. So that's really useful for two things. Um, it's really useful for the planetary pr protection task that JPL is trying to accomplish because they're very anxious um, not to find a life on Mars because they accidentally put it there, right? So understanding what contaminates the spacecraft is really important. But also if you want to target, uh, if, if you want to know who's there and how you can kill it, usually 30% of the uh, genome is completely fine, especially if you have a whole lot of replicate samples uh, that you can accumulate the data from. Um, and uh, then, then, then for extending this beyond stool and getting at all those samples that are a lot harder to access because of host DNA, uh, uh, host DNA contamination, um, Lisa Marotz in my lab has been doing some really uh, elegant work um, looking at host DNA depletion, where the, uh, where, where the procedure is to do a combination of uh, slow centrifugation uh, to separate the host cells, um, and then P a PMA to uh, lyse extracellular DNA. So the great thing about this is that any, any DNA that's not from an intact bacterial cell is going to be eliminated during this procedure. So uh, what we think we can use this for is even extensively host-contaminated DNA, uh, like for example, uh, like for example uh, tumor, uh, tumor samples. Um, but perhaps the most important aspect of all of this is that the task that we're doing when we're using um uh, the, the task that we're doing when we're, uh, when we're uh, using shotgun metagenomics to estimate what's happening in a particular sample uh, is that the estimation task is very simple, right? Because what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what all the genomes in the sample are, and what all the genes in each genome uh, are, and then we want to count all of those. And that's very simple to explain, right? And what it means is that we never have to explain OTUs to a clinician again, which is uh, perhaps the most valuable part of this whole exercise. Uh, okay, so where are we using this? Um, so uh, as, as, you, as you'll appreciate with complex collaborative projects, uh, it's hard to get permission to uh, show you like all the unpublished work mm -hmm. for something that's going to be a public, uh, public lecture. So I'll just give you an overview of uh, some of the places where we're using this right now. Uh, so one is on American Gut, where with Peter Durrestein's lab, uh, we have uh, matched meta metabolomics on 3,000 samples that we have 16S for already, and that we're doing shotgun metagenomics on, uh, so that we'll have a very large data set where all the way down at the gene level, including the viruses, uh, we're going to be able to see uh, how that relates to the, uh, to, to the dozens of questions and hundreds of food items uh, on, on the food frequency questionnaire uh, that people are filling in when they, uh, when they participate in American Gut. Uh, in the Earth Microbiome Project, we have a set of 500 reference samples uh, that we've already, um, we've already got data from, uh, for, from using the Nextera XT protocol, which was not particularly successful, like down at about 25% success. Uh, we're up at, uh, we're, we're up at uh, about 50% of samples passing QC uh, with, the, uh, with the Kappa Hyper Plus protocol, uh, again miniaturized on the, uh, on, on the Echo and the Mosquito. And uh, we're continuing to tune that protocol so that we can get more out of all of the sample types. Although at this point, I think we're, uh, I think we're at the stage where we can just rerun the samples in order to get enough reads rather than having to do something that's qualitatively different from a technical standpoint. Uh, the Fin Risk project uh, is really cool. So this is a cohort that we're working on with, uh, with Mohit Jain, who's our neighbor in the BRF2 building. And what he has is 8,500 samples that were collected 15 years ago with matched metabolomics uh, and then complete clinical records. So essentially what we're trying to figure out is uh, what can we tell about someone's future health from material they were just kind of flushed down the toilet. And uh, we've run a few hundred samples on that to do QC on basically at this point, and uh, the rest of the stuff's moved into processing, so that should be done around April. April. Uh, I mentioned some of the stuff from the JPL spacecraft assembly facility that Jake's working on. And if you want to know more about that, I suggest that you uh, chat with Jake about it at the symposium. 
Uh, he's also been doing some really cool stuff on the NICU at Jacobs, uh, essentially looking at the kinds of microbiomes that we can find in these uh, very low biomass samples in, in what's obviously a sensitive clinical environment. And this is just scratching the surface. So last year, uh, we processed about 25,000 samples with matched metabolomic and 16S data in my lab. Uh, this year, we're planning to scale that up to about 100,000 samples, where uh, most of those samples will have shotgun metagenomics associated with them, uh, not just the 16S profiles. Uh, so this takes us to the future of what we're really trying to accomplish with this. So right now, uh, all of this re relies on expensive instrumentation. And what we're hoping to do is to ultimately create a world where uh, kind of like your smartphone has a faster supercomputer in it than anything that existed in a supercomputing uh, center uh, 30 years ago, uh, like it has more processing power than the Cray 2, which was the fastest thing on Earth in, in uh, 1985 or so. Uh, what we're hoping is to move this stuff into, into clinical and ultimately consumer applications. So the idea is to make sequencing uh, not something exotic that you do in the lab, but perhaps something that you do routinely at home as you examine yourself in the mirror. And the idea is that we could, for example, as you breathe on the mirror, uh, whisk your breath away and do some kind of analysis uh, on it in real time, uh, whether it's chemistry by mass spec or whether it's some kind of uh, DNA sequencing based approach, uh, and give you some readout directly on the mirror. Obviously, we're still working on the user interface for this because you probably don't want it in quite that form. But, uh, you know, show you uh, a projection of your microbiome using the same kind of technology that backs Google Translate, uh, and, then, um, and then show you on these kinds of microbiome maps uh, where are you. Uh, how, how, does that, um, how does it correlate with any risk factors that you might have? And uh, are there any things that you can do to mitigate those, ri uh, r those risk factors during the day? And because we're dreaming here about the future, we could imagine having it communicate, for example, with your smart toilet, uh, so that if you have a direct microbiome readout of your gut, you can incorporate that. And also uh, have it uh, communicating with your smartphone, so that when you're in the supermarket and you're faced with a thousand kinds of yogurt, you can use augmented reality so that you can zoom in on the right one and pick it off the shelf and scan the barcode to make sure that you got the right one. And perhaps even have the activity that's monitored from your smartphone and uh, uh, information about recording your diet and so forth during the day to show you visions of yourself in that mirror uh, 10, 20, 50 years down uh, in the future about what you're going to look like if you do the same thing every day for all of those years as what you did today. So, um, so I realize this probably sounds uh, stupid, but in the same way, if you talk to someone 30 years ago about you know, uh, the car phone that executives on Wall Street have, uh, imagine that being coupled to a supercomputer that's faster than any that exists on Earth, and it's going to fit into the palm of your hand, and it's going to be networked uh, to, a, to a billion other ones just like it all around the world uh, in 30 years' time. You would have thought that was crazy. But the advance that's been packed into computation and telecommunications in 30 years has been packed into DNA sequencing in just 10 years. And so we need to think about this happening not 30 years down the track, but 10 years down the track. And we need to prepare for this kind of future now. So, uh, so that's why I founded the Center for Microbiome Innovation um, here at UC San Diego. Um, this has been, uh, so, so we started this last year, and uh, it's been truly remarkable in terms of bringing faculty together. So we have uh, now more than 100 faculty members associated with the center uh, along with their labs. And uh, we have an increasing um, uh, we, we have an increasing cast of uh, corporate uh, corporate partners in the center, including uh, Illumina, uh, Janssen, uh, BASF, uh, Biota, and, and most recently Kyogen. And we're talking to a couple more prospective members today in the, in the fields of uh, computation and mass spectrometry. So the idea is to really build together the, the the kind of academic industry partnership that's necessary to build the next generation of microbiome technology and deploy it very widely, uh, not just in research settings but in clinical and perhaps even consumer settings. And, uh, I, I, think, uh, and, and I think that's an incredibly, uh, uh, an incredibly exciting future uh, that, I hope you'll, uh, that I hope you'll join us in. Uh, so with that, I'd, uh, I'd just like to conclude by thanking the many people uh, involved in the stuff that I showed you today, uh, a lot of whom I mentioned individually uh, during the talk, so I'm not going to repeat this. Uh, I'd like to thank the many amazing members of my lab, both, uh, uh, both, both uh, current and formerly. Um, I, I realize I forgot to uh, uh, put in the latest version of the slide because, for example, uh, Austin, who's here in the audience and who recently joined us from LabSite as the Director of Research at the Center for Microbiome Innovation, is here in the audience today. And uh, I certainly encourage you to talk to him if you want to hear more about what we're doing. And uh, finally, I'd be delighted to take any questions. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to uh, open this very exciting uh, symposium. And thanks, to, uh, thanks again for your contribution to the amazing technology that allows us to do these kinds of things. <laughs>